Okay, fine, we're starting. All right, so let's look at page 46. Um, so this is a little bit of a writing from the previous page. Let's look at that, okay. Okay, so we we're just talking about uh, the fluctuations in specular stock movements, okay. And in this book, we wiped out numerous examples of past discrepancies. Okay, so we saw a little bit of this also in the previous session, that discrepancies between price and value. This is where you see the importance of understanding the price versus fair value paradigm, that we have to, um, uh, we, we notice that the value, especially in value investing, we are always playing this game and trying to see uh, what is the, what is given give the price, what is the distance between price and my assessment of fair value. And here I am a typical value investor. Okay, so um, now if you see here, uh, the variable. See this. So it's obviously difficult because, as I said, the main problem is that the market remains very unpredictable, and it will always remain that way no matter what kind of fancy uh, model you use. Your predictability basically applies to the same unpredictability that, had, that you have with life in general. You will have the same problem uh, in the markets as well. So um, you can see, yeah, which... Okay, so these are this is this is a particular term, special situations, okay, which is uh, sometimes we should no, make a note of this special situations. This is happening on page forty six, so we should write down page forty six and write that there's something to learn here. So page forty six, okay. term we want to highlight is the term we want to highlight is I'm looking for my star here no it's just not working anyway we'll put it later I'll just pass here so the term is special situations Okay, we can't copy from there. Special situations. Okay. This relates to um, in in the um, AM. AM stands for alternative asset management. So in the AM universe, uh, we also call it. Um, So this is a term that you need to know, event-driven. So this is similar, similar to special situations. So it's basically uh, when you hear the term event-driven, I run an event-driven hedge fund, what that means is I look for these kind of special corporate situations like what these mentioned here, okay, which is um, uh, yeah, inter-security arbitrage, okay, uh, merger arbitrage essentially. Uh, payouts, workouts and liquidations, okay, uh, protected certain types of special transactions. So these are uh, what we call special situations or special corporate situations where you have a buyout or something like that. So I'll just mention briefly about merger arbitrage. Um, so these are, again, inter-security arbitrage. So merger arbitrage is, again, basically I the stocks of companies that may be taken over. Okay, so this is what you think. You're speculating. Okay, you don't really know. There's no announcement as such. Because once the announcement comes, the stock will move and the game is over. So there's not much more to be made. So you've got to do it ahead of time. So you anticipate, you take some risk and buy the stocks of companies that may be taken over. Selling taken over. These guys are called 
targets. Okay, they are called targets. In MA parlance, they are called targets. And selling the stocks. Selling the stocks of companies. Selling the stocks of companies that may may take over the targets. And who are these kinds of companies? These are known as in the parlance, we call them. Virus. Okay. So this is basically one type of uh, intersecurity. When he says intersecurity arbitrage, this is what he's referring to: a merger arbitrage, okay, and other kinds of corporate special situations. But this, again, this arbitrage word. The other thing you have to understand: first, you have to learn this term, merger arbitrage, or simply called. Merger ARP. This is simply called merger ARP. Right. Just call it merger ARP for short. Okay. Now buying the stocks of companies that might get taken over targets and selling the stocks of companies, acquirers that might take over the targets. Okay. Now this the other thing you need to understand is uh, this is not a proper uh, use of the term arbitrage. So I've given you a discussion of classical riskless arbitrage, but there's no market risk left at all. Okay, so uh, this is not a proper use of the term arbitrage uh, because because it is. Not CRA. Remember CRA, classical riskless arbitrage. So this merger arbitrage. When we talk about merger arbitrage, we are not talking about classical riskless arbitrage because in classical riskless arbitrage, once you do the transaction instantly, there will be no market risk left. Okay, so that's so. What I would prefer personally is that nobody in the industry should use the word arbitrage unless they are referring to CRA. But the very reason why I have to cook up a term like CRA okay, is because people are using the word arbitrage in a loose manner to refer to transactions which are not really C, uh, CRA. So therefore, we have to cook up this term to make a distinction that this CRA will, will feature absolutely no market risk remaining after you do the transaction, which is all done instantly okay, in a few seconds. But this kind of arbitrage, merger arbitrage, what you're doing is you're taking a risk you think that uh, maybe idea will get bought over by Geo, so uh, Vodafone idea will get bought over by Geo, and then but there's no announcement yet. So you buy the stocks of Vodafone idea, and you buy and you sell the stock of let's say Geo is listed. Okay, you sell uh, Geo. Okay, so this is the idea that because these guys are acquirers, they are likely to overpay. So you should sell the stocks of the acquiring company, and those. Which are targets, they are likely to get a very rich price because generally companies pay more than the fair value. So, therefore, that's the logic based on which you're buying this. But there are many, many uh, uncertainties. First of all, you don't even know if this is going to happen, you're just speculating. So, therefore, there is no question that this, this is not arbitrage. There is a lot of market risk left here. If the deal doesn't happen, the target stock will collapse, okay, this will fall, and then you'll make a big loss. So. Therefore, there's tremendous amounts of market risk left when you do much merger up, when you do this kind of business. So you have to understand that. And so therefore, but unfortunately, the term has stuck. Okay, so the industry will continue to use the word merger arbitrage, although it is not really CRA. So you have to understand this at two levels. You have to understand what people mean when they say merger arbitrage or merger up. And you have to also understand at the same time, you're internally in your own brain, you should be telling yourself. That this is not a proper use of the term arbitrage because it is not CRA, and it uh, you know keeps market risk on the books. 
So it's not really CRA. So special situations. Inter-security arbitrage that he's talked about. So even here, this word is not really correct. Even here, for the same reasons that I just mentioned, the use of the word arbitrage here is not correct. Okay. You should not use the word arbitrage because it's not really CRA. Okay, so this is what it is. And uh, you know, you have other corporate situations. So there's one thing to learn is basically event-driven investing, special situations. Uh, is one type of investment style, uh, investing style. Yeah, so he's talking about, see, we just discussed all this, and he's discussed it over here. Okay, you can read this a little bit. Yeah, so that's why, so this is why you buy the shares of the target company, which you think is going to become a target. Okay, you're, you're basing a bet on that, and therefore the target stock will go up, and that's how you make a profit. Yeah, there's another problem here, and this one of the reasons why there's heavy market, high levels of market risk left. Obstacles uh, to mergers, you know, deals that don't go through. So just because just because you understand, just because you uh, you know, uh, think that uh, there's going to be a merger, that idea, Vodafone idea is going to be bought by Geo. Well, it may turn out to be that Geo does actually make an offer. But there are many, many uh, obstacles in between because you could have uh, the uh, CCI, okay, um, which will say that uh, this is not uh, appropriate because this will lead to concentration in the industry. This will lead to concentration in the industry, and the, therefore we are not going to allow this uh, merger to go through. So even though Geo makes an announcement, there are regulatory hurdles. So just like uh, what we say in English, is many there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. So this is one of those kinds of cases where for a merger to go through, it has to jump through a lot of hoops. So the parties have to agree to the deal, the pricing has to be correct, and then the regulators have to approve it. Only then the deal goes through. So that's why you find sometimes that even after an announcement of a merger, uh, the target company stock has not moved to the point of, uh, let's say here, if you have, uh, let's say, just in case that somebody announces that G is going to be taken over at a price of uh, 200 or 300. But you'll find even after the announcement, maybe the price is only hovering around maybe 240 or something. What's the uncertainty? Because the party have already agreed. So what's the uncertainty? Uncertainty is the regulatory uncertainty. The regulators may not allow this deal to go through. So that's why you would find a discount between the uh, announced price. Yeah. Yeah, announced price and the uh, price at which the market is uh, trading that stock, even after the announcement, because the market is not 100% confident that it's going to be go through because of other regulatory hurdles and things like that. Okay. So that's the... Uh, problem here. So this is why, um, yeah, what's reliable? Never really reliable. Nothing is ever guaranteed, as I said. Okay, these are footnotes. Okay. I don't want to go into the footnotes. If you have a problem with any of the footnotes, you can let me know, and then we can discuss it. Okay, so in general, I'll not cover the footnotes. Okay. So lower profitability of these special situations investing. This is okay, diminishing returns, which is basically that if everybody piles into the sector, the returns are going to go down because everybody's playing the same game. Right? Yeah. So Dow theory is a technical theory. Okay, so we we'll just mentioned this here, page 47. Dow theory is a technical theory. It, it belongs to the realm of technical analysis. You can read up on it using the sources that I've given you. I've given you lots of resources for technical analysis. So, okay. approach. Okay, so you can read up 
on it by using the reference text that I've given you and the websites that I've given you for uh, technical analysis uh, resources. Okay, so he's obviously crashing Dow theory because uh, Graham doesn't believe in technicals. And it seems he doesn't really understand it very well either. So um, anyway, so basically what he's saying is, is what he's talking about, the general message of this paragraph is that many methods which might work for a while eventually might reach a stage where there's diminishing returns or whatever for other reasons. Methods basically stop working. So this is basically a reiteration of what I've been telling you throughout, that nothing is guaranteed in this business just because something is working. You may do some analysis. You may come up with a trading system. You may analyze like 20 years of data. Okay, you may have so much data on GE. You may do some analysis. But, uh, and then eventually your analysis may not work out because the market keeps changing. So the best example of the market changing is, I've shown it to you, I'm not sure, I've shown this to you, this is West Texas Intermediate. Okay, look at this West Texas Intermediate data. This is the data, right? Now, see the difference in, uh, this is something I think, I don't, I don't think I've discussed, have I discussed uh, non-stationarity of time series data with you? Have I discussed that? Can anyone tell the stationarity of stationarity of 90? I don't think I have actually. Uh, no, okay, we have not discussed that. Okay, so this is something to under, understand basically that uh, we can use this actually to understand this point, although it's not really mentioned in the text. But what he's talking about is basically this, that certain approaches would work for some time, then eventually they stop working, which is basically what I've been telling you. Nothing is guaranteed. You may have a fancy model, but it may suddenly stop working. And one of the reasons it does that is you can understand this kind of, uh, this is something for you to do research on. Uh, uh, you can do further research on this, okay? working for a while. Okay. Output is uh, you understand what is meant by time series data, right? Time series data is what we've got here. This is time series data because it's over a period of time and you have multiple observations over a period of time. So this is an example of time series data. Most of the charts we look at in finance are actually time series, but there are also some cross-sectional data charts we look at, like yield curves and all that cross-sectional data. Okay. So time series data, this is non-stationary. Now, it's, it's a complex mathematical definition of non-stationarity, but let me give you the intuitive understanding of non-stationarity. Okay. So it's an important thing to understand uh, why so, because many of these models will not work. And so you need to have an understanding as intuitive level of what is meant by time to the data is um, on markets. Okay. Time to the data markets is what we call is non-stationary. Okay. This is a term in statistics, okay? Stationarity or non-stationarity of time series data. This is a concept in statistics. So if you read a high level statistics book, You'll find a discussion of these kind of terms. It won't be there in a basic book. But what does it mean intuitively? You can understand it by looking at this crude oil chart. This chart is so important that maybe I should just uh, uh, capture it and put it in your notes. Let me try and put this in your notes. What is meant by non-stationarity of time series data? Very important concept, and I'm going to try and give you an intuitive understanding of that. So look at this. You can now look at, um, look at the chart. Yeah. Now, can you see, can you notice that this period, say from 80s, from the 1980s, to uh, say about 2001, so about a 20 year period. You see this 20 year period, you draw, sorry, it doesn't work like that. 
Yeah. But imagine that you're drawing a rectangle here. Okay. You see how tight the price action is. You see how it's confined basically to about 37, 38. Okay, if you take 38. Now the low side is very low. It's about $8, $10, $9. Okay, so this is a pretty tight range, actually. Most of the time, it's actually around 35, you see, around 32. So most of the time, you can say it's about 30 to about 10 or $15. Okay, so it's a very tight range, 20 years, such a long time. And crude oil is at a very low level, actually, very low level. And it's confined to such a tight range. The very uh, This is a kind of a phase. We call this a regime. Regime, as in uh, here, we say there are unpredictable. So this is also a statistical term. Okay, we call it changes unpredictable because we don't know when they're going to happen. So, but what is a regime change? When when we change from at this see this kind of behavior can you see how this is qualitatively different from the period that emerges around here from the end of 2000 2001 onwards this is when the internet bubble has burst in the stock market and look at the look at now suddenly now look at the price action for this period 2001 onwards to here can you see the swings with the swing up down up down up down look at the swings it just actually went to zero. Actually, the front month futures contract was trading at a negative price. Okay, because of delivery complications. So, so this is the kind. Look at the volatility you can see for yourself. If you make a rectangle here, okay, and you make another rectangle here, can you see how different it is? It is almost like a different animal. Okay, see the difference. This is actually the same market, and this is one of the most important markets in the world. This is the North American benchmark for crude oil, West Texas Intermediate. Okay. And if you look at Brent, you'll get the same picture. Now, this is what is meant by not stationarity. That without any warning, something that was behaving like this, they were behaving so nicely like a little good little boy and staying quiet. And see what happens now. So much volatility goes up, shoots up, collapses, then she goes up again. Look at the ranges, look at the trading ranges. Totally different personality. This is what you call a statistical analysis. This is what you call a regime change. There was one regime that was prevalent here, and then suddenly nobody knew when this was going to happen. Suddenly the regime changed, and you get all this kind of crazy volatility. Okay, this is what is called a regime change. This is totally different from this. Okay. This is basically intuitively, you can keep this picture in your mind, that's why I put it in your notes. This is what is meant intuitively by the non-stationarity of time series data. So in statistical terms, we say that the parameters, okay, um, of the price distribution. It actually say parameters actually. It's more in line with the language of statistics. Statistical parameters. So parameters are example of parameters is mean, standard deviation, skewness, kurtosis, all these. If you look at these figures, if you do this analysis here, to see that suddenly all these things have changed. Mean, standard deviation, skewness, kurtosis between this regime and this regime. But it's the same market. And the big basic problem is a regime change where the statistical parameters will change from a statistical point of view. But visually, it is better to understand it intuitively the way I showed you. Remember this picture? That's how you understand it intuitively. The total, the, the nature of the animal changes completely. So. This is basically why the models don't work. And you have no way of knowing when this change is going to come. And again, this could, this could also change. This kind of behavior could also change. So this is the problem with the non-stationarity of time series data. 
okay, the more more liquid the market is, the more likely this is likely to happen. Okay, so it's but it's anyway it is non-stationary. Even if you look at illiquid markets, they will also be non-stationary. Okay? So this is the problem. This is why you have to be. You should remember this picture because when people sell you fancy financial models, you should under, remember this that those models are all built based on some kind of analysis of past data. Okay, but this is why. The analysis of past data is not very useful because the future, the next regime, would be radically different. Okay, so that's basically the problem. So it's an important point. That's why I spent some time on it. Important for you to understand. Okay, because even at IMF, we were we were not taught about the non-stationarity of time series data. We were just taught a bunch of techniques. But eventually, I had to discover the hard way in my own working, uh, you know, through my own. Uh, trading, that uh, this stuff is non-stationary. So I had to discover all this on my own. Here you have, I'm informing you ahead of time. That that's why you should be very careful about uh, any kind of uh, model. Rely getting, don't fall in love with the model, because this is an important thing to remember. Okay, so this is taking, uh, this takes care of your uh, understanding of non-stationarity. Okay, very important concept. Yeah, so this is Yeah, so this is he is now talking about his own approach to investing, which is the price, uh, you know, basically try to buy as he already explained to you in the a few pages ago. That is you try to buy stocks below the tangible asset value. So that's why you basically and go for a high margin of safety, which is basically to make sure that whatever the tangible asset value is, you buy it at a much lower price. So if you go back to our favorite uh, and blue chip stock, which is now looking like a uh, almost like a penny stock, but this is uh, General Electric, and so if you see that, if you feel that General Electric to tangible asset value is maybe 260 and the price now is uh, 98 okay now this is the kind of stock that Graham would like to buy it that's what he's saying he'll do an analysis of tangible asset value and then he'll look at the market price if there is a steep discount in the market price then he'll like to buy it okay this is his approach this is basically what value investing is and this is where you have this margin of safety concept saying it was not difficult to find those but even today if you even Warren Buffett if you see Buffett also admits that uh, value investing is hard to do these days because all the stocks have gone up so much in price that it's hard to find true bargains so Buffett also admits that Okay, so what he's saying is because from time to time, these uh, availability of bargain issues will uh, fluctuate. This is obviously a function of how the market moves. Okay, so if you have to go back to buy, okay, so we don't have too much data here, but you can see, right? So this is the internet bubble, the late 90s, the internet bubble, then the internet bubble collapses. So when the stock market is around these, uh, this kind of a low. Obviously, there will be many, many bargains available because people have sort of panicked and started selling stuff. So it's much uh, kind of sure prices are beaten down. It's more likely to find bargains around this uh, this low, also around this low. Okay. But here, where it says right now, markets have gone up so much, so it's very difficult to find bargains. Okay, so if you look at, which is basically what he's saying is, if you look at, for instance, if you use the screener. You try to look at screener and see. What more? It doesn't scale very well. Okay, we keep that. We just try to look at stocks which are below the fundamental tick. 
better. Let's try to look at stocks we have. Under price to book. Let's look at if they have anything. Which is under one. How many stocks do we have under one? 833. But how many of these stocks have a reasonable market cap? We want to look at a reasonable market cap. Large caps, only large caps. Okay, let's look at mid cap. 833. Now you see, only 100 stocks. That too, only mid cap. Mid cap is not really that liquid necessary. If you go for large cap, you have a bigger problem. Look at large cap. Down to 64 stocks. There are only 64 large cap stocks which are, um, which shall we say, which meet the criteria of uh, price to book being more less than one. Price to book ratio is less than one. The price to book ratio obviously is market price per share divided by book value per share. And book value per share will be your if you take uh, net worth and divide by the number of shares, okay, so that's your book value per share. Okay, so take the net worth divided by number of shares, so book value per share, and that's the denominator. And then you use the numerator of price per share. And that gives you, uh, what was I saying, price to book, where we are, actually. Price to book ratio uh, under one. So you can see there are only 64 uh, large cap companies that meet the requirement. Then again, this is uh, price to book. You have to find out. You can do other other listings like uh, go here, the value investor. to price to earnings under 10. You can see how few 88. The 88 number the price to earnings below uh, below uh, 10 the price to earnings ratio. This way you can look at some of these. Uh, what he's basically saying is that they will as the market fluctuates, the opportunities will number of opportunities will vary. At this point, of course, it's not likely to have too many opportunities, as you can see now on the screen that we just did. And so we have this. Then, So it will, it will disappear, then it will appear again, then again it will disappear. This is how it happens because of the, uh, it's all driven by the fluctuations of the market. Okay. So what he's saying here is that uh, it's not worth trying to um, this it's not worth trying to beat the market unless you think you can add pre-tax a pre-tax return of five uh, percent to your average annual return from equities but then of course the problem is uh, you don't know in advance how much return you're likely to make so this kind of a decision rule is not very uh, useful according to me because it's not precise enough to be used objectively. Okay, just add how do you know and for instance what basis are you saying you're gonna get more than five percent before taxes? Okay? Because you're actually trying to predict the future. Can't really predict the future. So there's no basis for saying this. So again but essentially what he's saying is this that uh, basically he's saying that there should be some kind of a threshold return which you expect, uh, which which if you don't think is going to happen, then you don't take the effort of trying to beat the averages. That's what he's saying. Okay. 
a very profound statement from Blaise Pascal, French uh, scientist, maybe mathematician or something, a uh, French uh, thinker, you could say. Yeah. Okay, so this is commentary on chapter one. We should write this as commentary on chapter one. Should you before, never trade on the advice of your stockbroker because your stockbroker doesn't really care whether you make money or not. The stockbroker wants you to trade. So you should not trade with someone on the advice of someone whose incentives are not aligned with yours. If the stockbroker's incentives are not aligned with yours because even when you lose money, he makes money. He doesn't really care. But that's why you should never trade on the advice of your stockbroker. You use your own analysis. And unfortunately, I don't think it's very clear. Okay. This thing is not very clear. But thorough analysis is a subjective. Thorough analysis is a subjective word. Promises, safety of principle, this is problematic. Because promises don't mean anything. I mean, I can. So these promises don't mean anything, but everything is not certain. So, uh, there's no need to worry to, to take this definition that seriously. You understand what he's trying to say. Okay. Let's get a sense of what he's trying to say uh, in the definition that he thinks that investing means doing more thorough analysis. Speculation is uh, not, not doing that analysis. But uh, in fact, uh, everything is speculation actually, no matter how much analysis you do. This is more important, actually. This is reminding you of what I wrote earlier. Cut losses, cut losses, and cut losses. Three Golden Rules of Investing by Ed Sekoda. So if you read that book, Pocket Wizards, very interesting interviews. And uh, so this is, I think, the most important of the principles. Okay, Use tight stop losses to lose too much money on a particular trade. Again, the definition of investor versus speculator. We call it all, all the time the distinction between price and value and uh, try to assess the fair value of the stock. statement. Uh, maybe it's true in the over, in the very long run, but generally it's not good to think in these ways because the market can uh, beat you up like several years in a row. So uh, more, what is more important is that you follow a disciplined risk control plan so that even if you lose money, you don't lose more than what you budgeted to lose. And a budgeted loss is part of your annual planning because in every business you can make a loss. Trading is also a business, so when you start out, you have a certain risk capital allocated for that year. So you say, okay, this year I'm willing to lose $10 million in trading. And so as long as your losses are below the annual budgeted loss, then it's okay. I mean, in some sense, it's okay, because at least you didn't lose more than you budgeted. The problem is when you start losing more than you budgeted for. That's the problem. 
that's when you find that you're basically heading into bankruptcy and stuff because you don't have the money to cover those kind of losses. And most of it is a re repeat because it's just repeating what, the, what Graham has already said before. We can hide this. Yeah, he's referring to the internet bubble, which is this part in the 90s. He's referring to this part. Okay. Everybody started trading stocks. So that's the bubble part that he's referring to. This day trading is the term that emerged in the 1990s. So this day trading refers to now. Here, we want to come up with a definition of day trading. Can anyone give me a definition of day trading? Yeah, anybody? Everyone is sleeping. Anybody wants me to give wants to give me a definition of day trading? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, so, uh, all right, okay, so the volume is also okay. My volume is because my throat is a little bit in bad shape, so I'm not able to speak very loudly, but you can still hear me clearly, right? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, so um, that's good. So nobody knows a, a definition of day trading. Let me give you this definition important to know the precise definition we can have a precise definition of day trading like this sir, investing may i yeah, try yes yeah sure go ahead sir, sir, day trading may be the trading of financial instrument uh, in a particular day either buy or sell no can you can you uh, can you elaborate not very clear can you elaborate it, you're not on sir, the wrong uh, track. You're, you're, I need to. You need to be more complete and precise. Can you elaborate, uh, sir? From a uh, from a trader point of view, we can say that uh, suppose today is twenty third September. So a particular yeah. trader buys sell securities in a day okay. and made some I, speculations I, in the market. Okay, so that's like we would not use. We would prefer not to use. Uh, terms like speculation, that's okay, you can use it, but uh, speculation, investing, and either, uh, when you say speculation, it seems like you're distinguishing between that and investing and all that, so we don't need to go into that, but you're, you're right, I think you understand it, but you're not expressing it in a perfect way, let me tell you the precise definition. Day trading means okay. that starting in the day with Zero position across all the stocks. Okay. This would basically mean, which basically means that whatever you whatever positions you create. You create during the day. Okay. You must square off. You understand what a square off? Square off means a lip, uh, you know, terminate and end those positions, basically. Liquidate those positions. Square off before the end of the day. Okay. So if somebody says that they're doing day trading, should always be true that whenever you look at their position, 
either before the start of the trading day or at the end of the trading day, of any trading day. You should end with, or just one of those is correct. You just lose, don't even need start, starting and ending. This is good enough. We can supply this because our definitions also have to be uh, lean and efficient. So I should not use more words or conditions than I need. This is sufficient. If you end the day with zero, that means uh, you'll be starting the next day with zero. So this is good enough. Okay. So this is, a, you can see, it's a very precise definition. Okay. We look at any trader's books. If there are any positions left at the end of the day, he's not a day trader. If you want to be a day trader, you must end the day with zero positions. If this is the definition of day trading. You can buy 10,000 million, you can do 10,000 million transactions during the day. That's not important. But what is important is whatever you buy, you sell. Whatever you sell, you buy back. So the end of the day, you must be having, you must be left with only zero positions. That's all that matters. So day trading is an important term which you should know the correct definition of. Let's see here. I think I forgot to set an alarm for you all. Uh, we are supposed to end at what time? Is it over? No, it was 2.30, no? Yeah, 2.30, okay. Okay, we have the alarm, okay, that's fine. Okay. Whatever positions you create during the day, you should enter it. Day trading, ignoring diversification. I've already told you that there are many very successful investors who also ignore diversification. So, flipping, flipping means uh, buying and selling. So, there's a matter of the term flipping houses. There are many people in the US who uh, do this. I'm sure many people do it in India as well. We don't call it flipping. In the US they call it flipping. So these guys basically, they buy houses, they kind of refurbish the houses a little bit and then they sell it off. And uh, they never intend to live in those houses. So investment properties basically. They're doing it in a fairly active way. That's flipping. Um, the systems seem to work. So stock picking systems. These are all basically all trading models. Yeah, okay, fine. So just basically luck and method, but the problem is that even Graham's method, uh, basically there's no guarantee because you may buy something, you may look at some beaten down stock, maybe. You may look at, uh, we look at our favorite beaten down stock, uh, GE. We look at GE, we buy big name stock, big company, in, but, and you think the fair value is 300, so you buy it at 98, the price is 98. But, well, it may never go to 300, there's no guarantee that it's going to 300. You may sit around. Maybe five years, six years. Price may not do much. It may just hang around here. It's not going anywhere. You've tied up your capital and you're not making any returns. So there's no guarantee. So even following Graham's rules, uh, there's no guarantee that you'll be successful. Okay, uh, But you need to know as a finance professional, the reason we are covering this book is it's considered an investment classic. So it's a good thing for you to be able to say at an interview that we covered this book and we kind of did a uh, detailed studies, we did a lot of uh, incidental discussions around the ideas are in the book or that are related to ideas in the book. So you can mention this, you can read the book for yourself as well. So even though it's not perfect, but you should, as a financial professional, you have to be aware of these books. Okay. So, temporary. Average holding period of the investments have gone down over time. 
Okay, so this is a this is just is saying that this indicates that people are becoming more secular here again. But this is not really true actually because some of the most successful hedge funds actually. Uh, so let's look at this point actually make this point 51. Let's look at this page 51. Page 51 and talk about these arguing for a low turnover rate. Yeah, turnover rate is twenty percent. Uh, so average stock typical shareholder held a stock for five years, and then it became like eleven point four months. Now, what he's saying is basically, Graham implies okay, that uh, low. Turnover rate, turnover rate, or a high of the users, um, holding period, okay, or a long holding period, long holding period. So, no turnover rate means long holding period. Graham is implying. Once again, this is just like when we studied diversification. Remember, I told you that uh, Graham is in favor of diversification. But uh, when he's talking about diversification in a positive way, although actually Buffett himself is one of those guys who's actually not in favor of diversification much. So uh, uh, you can't really say that that's necessarily a feature of value investing. But you can see here that. Uh, so what is he saying? So just like he was a, a favor, he seemed to be in favor of diversification. And I pointed out to you that many successful investors are actually not in favor of diversification because they think that concentrated bets are more uh, likely to pay off and they manage the risks of those bets in certain ways. So they basically they're not in favor of diversification. So similarly, there's another important point here. He seems to argue that a low high, low turnover on a long holding period is a good thing and the advice versa. But here I must tell you that this very famous uh, asset management firm, uh, a lot of bond uh, traders follow. very actively You're trading very actively and that means that you have a lot of fund traders trade uh, very active in the short period for investments uh, most famous of which I mean the book should be the most famous and more successful also actually most successful hedge funds of all time most successful hedge funds of all time most successful is a farm called There are some interesting YouTube interviews with this guy, Jim Simons, okay. Renaissance, Renaissance Technologies. Okay. In the market, we just call it uh, Red Tech. Okay. It's called as Red Tech. So when somebody says Red Tech, if you look at a quad message board, if somebody says, I worked at Red Tech, it means they worked at Renaissance Technologies. The, uh, most famous uh, founder of Renaissance is Jim Simons. Okay. He's actually a mathematician. He's 
or a famous theorem also against his name. Uh, it's Gerald uh, Simon's theorem. But you can look up uh, Renaissance technologies and Jim Simons on YouTube. There are many lectures okay, you can see. This guy is actually a maths prof. He used to be a math professor, and uh, at uh, Sunny Sunny at Stony Brook, I think, was the head of the mathematics department. But then he started his own hedge fund. Today, this is one of the most successful and uh, most successful, famous hedge funds of all time. And these guys most famously trade very very actively. Okay, so here you have the example of, I mean, they have very short holding periods. So, so therefore, um, uh, so it's not again true what Graham is saying, uh, his traditional view that low turnover, uh, a high turnover is necessarily a bad thing. That's not true. Okay. So most contrary to the most famous hedge fund. And then also the other important firm that you should be aware of is um, so here the English may not be exactly perfect because I'm just writing the sentences the pieces, okay? Also, um, high frequency, another term that we need to know, okay? High frequency. It doesn't care. Yeah. Okay, here we'll make this. Yeah. My frequency traders like this is a company called Virtue Financial. Okay. I'll explain to you what uh, Virtue Financial is actually like a market making kind of firm. But they are a HFT trader. Okay. So high frequency traders, it's high frequency trading is referred to as HFT. Did another remember another term? HFT. If this is there are some controversies in India as well about these guys, and uh, so some of these guys try to try to locate their server uh, near the NSC and uh, close to the NSC servers because they trade so fast that they, you know, just by getting advantage of a few milliseconds, they can uh, profit from that, or they think they can profit from that. So they located their servers in the NSC building or something like that. Basically, they tried to get very close to the NSC, that is our, which used to be the National Stock Exchange. The, uh, and now they call themselves NSC uh, in Bombay. They tried to locate their own servers uh, near the NSC servers, and the NSC allowed it. Actually, the NSC probably sold this as a facility. And they made money out of it by giving people the privilege of locating close to their servers putting their own servers close to the NSC servers. Now, these guys did that, and then SEBI actually fined NSC some huge amount of money, actually. I don't know what it was, it was some, a very big sum of money. And uh, this, uh, so, so basically, this is another issue that you have to be aware of. What is HFT? If somebody asks you in an interview, HFT stands for High Frequency Trading. And so the other people who have very short holding periods Renaissance, Renaissance is not really an HFT trade uh, uh, firm because they don't trade that frequently. Their holding period is probably more like three days or like one week or something like that, or ten, or 10 days, something like that. So one to two weeks, three days. Those kind of uh, periods is what Grand Tech is talking about. But high frequency traders mean that their, their, frequent, their uh, trade time frame is like a few seconds. Okay. Just buy something or sell something in a few seconds. You want to get some kind of a positive movement, and immediately you know, you're hoping for that, and then they immediately reverse the transaction. That's really high frequency trading. So one of the most famous high frequency trading firms is a firm called uh, Virtue Financial. Okay. So this is started by I think, a Romanian guy, maybe a U.S. citizen now. The Romanian sounding name. So this is a very successful firm, virtual financial. Very, very successful. They make a lot of money and they're high frequency traders. So once again, another very, very famous and profitable firm that does not follow what Graham is saying, that you know, necessarily that high turnover not is not a good thing. It's not true. Okay. 
uh, in real life, you know, many cases where uh, people don't follow this advice and still they do very well. So that's just a, you should be aware of what is meant by HFT and uh, quant traders. Quant traders basically are, quant traders are people who use the quantitative models to trade. And they try to capture several things like SAS, sentiment, technical indicators, or fundamental indicators, and the main reason they're called quant is that they always operate with quantitative models. Okay, so they always have quantitative models which uh, guide their decisions. That's why they're called quant traders. Okay. Now, now, okay. Let's see here. So Vinik is one of the he's the one who started managing the uh Federating Magellan Front after uh, Peter Lynch resigned. Okay, Peter Lynch uh, retired. So he's the guy who wrote uh, what up on Wall Street. And Jeff Vinick managed the Fidelity Magellan Front and one of the most famous funds in the history of US equity trading, which uh, has been managed by was managed by Peter Lynch as well. So basically what they say, even guys who manage the Fidelity Magellan Fund are uh, kind of swayed by the desire to make short-term profits. And they get swayed from this long-term discipline that Graham has taught them. So that's what they're saying. Said this reading it was strange actually. 30. Okay, so he's referring to the kind of frenzy trading that happened in the internet boom mid to late 90s. So talking about uh, so it's basically uh, trashing people who trade stocks at, with short at a high turnover rate so basically trashing the uh, the kind of promotional activities done by the online brokers okay so this, of course any business will do this any business will try to promote their product or service that's what these guys were doing peak of the stock market when everybody starts talking to stocks at uh, in 1999 when it's like almost the end of the boom everybody was trading stocks okay, even people who have no understanding of the stock market so look at all this here
And so these are people who are basically saying that, you know, people were not, he, this is the kind of guy that, or, uh, that Graham would refer to as speculators because they're not doing enough research and they're just kind of coming in and buying on tips and things like that. So. And media, media frenzy about stocks and all that. So you can read this on your own later on. It's basically talking about all the excesses that happened in the, in the 1990s, late 1990s stock market boom which is quite common at the top of stock market bubbles. You see that? It's quite common at the top of stock market bubbles that there'll be tremendous frenzy in public participation. So that's what he's talking about here. So you can read these. I mean, we, there's no special learning here as such other than the fact that everybody was getting into stocks and people were not doing enough research. Now the main issue, the main reason they lost money later on, because they didn't have good risk control. Not so much the analysis, they, whether they did the analysis or not. It's the fact that they had poor risk control. Okay, you can do uh, maybe limited research and you can still uh, protect yourself if you have good risk control. And so you may spend like five minutes uh, just doing this analysis, seeing that there is a trend which has broken, a long trend has broken in the stock market. Very long trend, actually. You see, this trend is very, very long. Uh, we never saw any kind of decline of the break of the previous low after the you know, after the um, onset of uh, after the onset of KFO, uh, You know, I mean, kind of around the. Uh, Second wave of the second wave of COVID. Okay. So you can see after a long uh, time, finally this thing has broken. You see that sequence of higher highs, higher lows, no break. Finally, there is a break. Okay, so you could just do this analysis. It takes five minutes to do the analysis, and you could go short. But you have to be disciplined. If you go short, that means you're saying. That this long uptrend has ended. Okay, you're going short. You're saying this long uptrend has ended after COVID, like the COVID-induced fall. But if that's what you're saying, if you're right, then there should be no fresh high for quite some time. Because if there's a fresh high, then your assumption about the trend having ended at its previous break high is not correct, obviously. So therefore. Uh, you have to basically, what you have to do is, you can go short with very limited research. You see that there is a break of the trend. If you're a mean reversion investor, you think that this is a uh, chance for this long rally to uh, do some mean reversion and come back to maybe around 340 or something like that. And so for that, you go short once you get the break here. The trend is uptrend is neutralized, you get a break. But what you have to be careful about is that you go short, but you must place a tight stop. Because you said that the trend, your view is that the trend is uptrend is over for now. Okay, a big segment of the uptrend is over. So you must put a stop at the point where the market proves you to be wrong. Because if your statement, if your assumption is that the market has reached its peak, for at least you know, several months, and it's going to cause a big decline, like to these levels. Okay, if that's your assessment, then yeah, you're saying it'll come down to about you know, 360s, 360 levels. If that's your assumption, that's fine. You can go short, but you must place a stop at this point because the moment a new high is made in the stock market, it immediately invalidates your assumption that it is now going to be a big decline to 360 levels. Okay? Because if that's going to happen, there should not be any new high made. 
And if the movement to new high is made, it means that the trend is continuing. Because there's a new uptrend. There's a new low, new higher low. Compared to this higher low. And there's a new higher high. Compared to this one. Okay. So therefore, this is where your stop has to be. Your stop is always generally at the point. The stop is at the point where you are proved wrong or your assumptions are invalidated. Where you, so this is where you please the stop. So the point, basically what, um, what Graham is saying here, what Graham is saying is that, um, what Graham is saying is that uh, they, they lost money because they didn't do enough research. That's not really true. What really, the, the reason why these guys lost money is because they didn't have good risk control. That was the problem. You can do limited research and in five minutes you can decide to sell. But what you have to do is you must have tight risk control. You must not place, uh, you know, must not sell too many shares. You must pre-plan your loss compared to your total capital. And you must place a stop over here so that if it goes above this, that's it. You're out of the game. Now you can't lose any more money. You'll take a loss. And so this is the six, this is the secret to long-term survival in the financial markets. That your bet size should be quite small so that you don't take a huge risk compared to your total capital. We did these calculations. If you remember once before, we did this calculation, I remember uh, I think it was a little after class, but uh, Malika was there, I remember, and I think somebody, Mayak maybe was also there. So they gave in some, gave some inputs. So we said that if you have a risk capital of 100,000, then per trade, you should not list, risk too much money. Uh, so this is where I think Malika said that we should not risk more than 1%. So that's $1,000 per trade. And then you should see where you're going to enter. So here you enter. This is your entering here at the market. Okay, 437. You're entering at 437, and you have to exit at let's say this level, whatever this price is, high level, high price here. You can see it here. High price is 454. So 450, let's say 455, and you're entering at 4, 440. Let's say. So you're entering. This is how you should do it. Entering at. Uh, and you are going to exit at four. And you will enter at and you will exit at four fifty-five. So you know that that you exit on a loss. Okay, that's your pre-planning of the loss, the trade. You know that if it goes above this, that means your theory about a big drop in the stock market is invalidated because it just made a new high. I think the uptrend is continuing. So this is where your stop should be, so 455. So you plan it before entering here, you will exit here. So that's a loss of risk per trade is uh, PNL is calculated as exit minus entry. Remember that. Okay. Exit minus entry. So per share you're going to lose. And I'll just finish this point again. That the main reason that they lost money is uh, we finish it as uh, we can finish it here. Uh, yeah, so this will finish at end of page 54. Okay, but I'll finish this point. Uh, you should have good risk control. That's what really makes the difference, which is that you enter, you plan your trade, you're going to enter here, you're going to exit here. So per share, you're going to lose $15. And you have been told, because your risk capital is only 100000 you want to risk a small percentage only of that per trade, 1%, which is 1000 Okay, now, if you are losing uh, $15 per trade, and you can afford to lose only 1,000. Then how many shares can you buy? The answer is 66. Because it's an integer 
you want to trade in round lots, 100 shares each, uh, multiples, integer multiples of 100 shares. Okay, also these days you can trade through or innovative fractional shares, but it's not a good practice. Better to be an institutional trader, train like an institutional trader. Integer of how much? So you get a total amount, you can lose only 1,000. Per share, you're losing 15. So the number of shares you can afford to buy is 1,000 divided by 15. Okay, here. So, okay, this is actually, oh, yeah, this will still have a negative figure. Don't worry about it. It's still 66 shares. Okay. This is how you figure out how many shares to buy. So the reason, the reason people lose money is number one, is they buy too many shares. And then number two, they don't exit. They don't follow a disciplined exit. So they will go short. The market breaks through and keeps rising, and they don't cut their losses. That's why Ed Sekota said, cut losses, cut losses, cut losses. Okay, so this is basically the message, all right? So I'll let you go. The uh, class is over. You can leave. And those who have questions can stay back. The rest of you can leave. Yeah, any any questions? I hope you were able to hear me clearly because my voice was really not in good shape today. So you were, it, it was like a normal session. Right? So somebody who is remaining can tell me. Was it okay in terms of a, uh, you are able to you are being able to hear? Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, okay. So any questions? Okay, so we end the meeting then. So we're down to 24 people. There are no questions then. What I will do is I'll have to first stop recording. Stop recording.